treat today. First of all, how many people here were alive when men walked on the moon? Raise your hand. And uh, young people who were not alive, raise your hand. So I think actually there are more people here today who were not around when this remarkable event occurred than were. And it's very important that those of us who were lucky enough to be alive then pass along the history. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to hear it firsthand for the people we were lucky enough to be alive. They were ever so fortunate enough to make the history. So I'm going to have them all come up on the stage together. Gentlemen, if you all come up and we'll give a brief introduction to them. Please give them a round of applause. This is Tom Stafford, Tommy Duke, Dan Cernan, and Ed Buckley. Please take your seats. Get up over there. It's great to have you here. Gina, who's sit there? Ed, who's sit there? Yeah, that's it. Stand up, kids. Stand up. Four flights, two of them Gemini, Apollo 10, got within 47,000 feet of the surface of the moon, and then, of course, Apollo Soyuz, where uh, at the end of the Cold War, the tail end of the Cold War, Americans and Russians met in space. Gene Cernan, they call him the last man to walk on the moon. And that's a sad statement in some respects. He's proud of it? Yeah, that's right. Most recent man to walk on the moon. There you go. <laughs> Charlie Dew, Apollo 16, was on, on, walked to the moon with John Young, and uh, we will uh, hear their amazing tales. Along with them is Ed Buckby, who is the author of a fantastic book I recommend to you called The Real Space Cowboys. It's on Amazon. He was there the whole time with these guys as a public affairs specialist and was a, uh, actually, look at the picture there. That's Werner von Braun who he was a confidant of. He worked at the Redstone uh, Arsenal, which ultimately became the Marshall Space Flight Center, or it was nearby anyhow. And uh, he was a part of the program and, and basically saw the, the colorful side of the program that you've seen in the right stuff and so forth. Got some of these guys out of a few scrapes here and there, which maybe we can share a few stories about. But uh, all right, one more time, give them a collective round of applause. Let's start in 1962, September of 1962. John F. Kennedy, who actually on May 25th of 1961 had gone before a joint session of Congress only 20 days after Alan Shepard did a very short suborbital mission and said, you know what, we're going to the moon. Look, what, what an amazing thing. No one knew at that time that that was even possible. Uh, and frankly, we now know that Kennedy was doing it as much as anything for geopolitics as anything else. But then in September of 1962, he came to Houston, Rice University, the stadium there, and he gave this speech. Oops. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that boat will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Now those are some stirring words. Gentlemen, when someone, a president stands up and says, we're going to the moon and we're doing it because it's hard. You can't help but look around at our leadership this day in general and wonder, we don't have these kinds of leaders anymore. First of all, where were you when those words were uttered, Tom Stafford, and what went through your mind? Well, I was at the test pilot school at Edwards as an instructor at a test pilot. And I said, well, it's a heck of a challenge. Of course, I always wanted to go higher and faster. And it turns out, in the end, with Gene Cern, myself, John Young, we did go faster. I bet you didn't think you'd be there when you saw that speech. Gene Cernan, when you saw that speech, did you think you'd be walking on the moon someday? I, I had just come, I'm a naval aviator, I just came home from my second cruise in the Western Pacific and Alan Shepard flew within a week after I got back. And someone 
asked me how would I like to do that. Of course, I wouldn't qualify, didn't have enough jet time, hadn't been in test pilot school. Sitting, sitting behind the, the, the fence of the television screen said, oh yeah, I'd love to do that. By the time I get good enough, there won't be anything left to do. How oh, that statement changed the lives of so many, changed, changed the life of a country, quite frankly, uh, and certainly changed our lives, uh, the three of us here on the stage. Charlie Duke, similar thing, did you see it and say, I'm going? Uh, no, I did not say I'm going. <laughs> I was like, gee, uh, when this first started was in May 61, and I was a fighter pilot over in Germany, uh, and, uh, and he said, we're going to go to the moon. I said, yeah, sure. You know, back then it was 5, 4, 2, 1, blow up rather than lift off, and we only had 15 minutes in space. Uh, so I didn't start dreaming about it, but when he made this speech, I was back at uh, MIT and actually working on the guidance and navigation system for Apollo right after that. So uh, MIT had the contract. Then I began to dream about maybe one day I get to go. And Bumpy, it's hard to overstate how much we didn't know when he uttered those words. Uh, did that, I mean, did, did you really think it was possible? I mean, you were around Werner von Braun, the great visionary. But I, I, knew, I knew von Braun wanted to go into space from, from the early days of his life. But I tell you, the first time I heard him give that talk about we're going to send these guys to the moon, I, I thought I'd made a mistake of going to work for the wrong guy. But, you know, NASA really didn't have a mission. Uh, these guys didn't have a job until JFK took, took us to that, that challenge of going to the moon. And the other thing you got to understand, we also were charged with kicking the Russians' butt in space. There you go. Let's not forget that. Let's see what, what, what happened in the course of a decade, which is extraordinary, is we ended up with a scene like this. This is Eugene on the moon, uh, wow. Apollo 17, yeah. December of 1972. Let's listen for just a minute. Let me tell you, Bob, this flag is a beautiful picture. That's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you. Well, it's kind of hard to top that one, Gene, when you uh, see old glory there on the moon like that. You know, when you're up there and you're going through that checklist, right? Which is what you got to do. It's very prescribed. Did you have a moment to really stop and take in the emotion of the moment? I mean, when that flag comes up, you, got, you can't help but be a little bit patriotic and think about the moment of history of which you're a part. You didn't have the time, but you took it. You, you, you involuntarily had to look over your shoulder all the time and look at the earth and ask yourself if you fully appreciated where you were at that moment in space and time and history. And somewhere along the way, you realize that you are representing some 200 or 250 or 300 million people. But all you can do is go out there and do your best. And uh, fortunately for for all of us, our best apparently is good enough. But the tribute goes to the American people because we were the tip of the arrow. And think about this as a tribute to American ingenuity and industry and commitment and dedication. Everyone who went to the moon came home. There you go. And we're going to talk a little bit about Apollo 13, which some would say, some would say it was Apollo 